Tyson, thank you very much, Anthony, for being here uh, today. I, I don't know how many of you know this, but this is his first visit to India after he took over as CEO and President of Marriott. So welcome uh, back to India in your new role and thank in your you. new avatar. You know, there's a whole host of things that I want to talk to you about, Anthony, but let me start by asking you about the outlook for 2023. Uh, in your own words, 2022 was a terrific year. Uh, you had record financials. Uh, given the global uncertainties that we're seeing today, I know that you've held out a very broad assessment of mm -hmm. what uh, the 2023 outlook is. Uh, do you believe that we're likely to be at the higher end of that range, the lower end of that range? Is demand holding strong, especially in the Asia-Pacific region? Let's start with that. Great. Well, let me start with a thank you uh, to the, the HICSA organizers, but also to all of you. We're all leaders in the travel industry, and I think filling ballrooms like this, reminding people of the power of in-person interaction is enormously valuable, so thank you. Uh, as you point out, 2022 was a remarkable year. Uh, the company set records for uh, fees, adjusted EBITDA, adjusted EPS, and remember, we achieved those numbers with a very difficult January because of the, the Omicron variant, and with China, one of our largest markets, largely locked down for 10 and a half months of the year. So our forecast for 2023 is for continued strong growth. As you point out, we gave a relatively large uh, range of RevPAR growth globally, 6 to 11 percent, so 100 or 200 basis points wider range than we might typically because of some of the economic uncertainty you described. But I, I was in Boston last week or two weeks ago meeting with analysts. All of them ask the right logical questions, given the interest rate environment, given inflation, given socio-political instability in certain areas of the world. Don't you see an end to this tremendous arc of recovery? And the answer is we don't see it in the data yet. Uh, the first quarter should be really, really strong when we report earnings in a few weeks. Uh, we continue to see strong forward bookings. The only caveat I would give you is for transient business, we're dealing with a relatively short booking window. So the ability to tell you forward bookings look good could change relatively quickly, but we're just not seeing it in the data yet. Well, that, that's good to hear that at least at this point in time, demand visibility right. tells you that things are still holding. Uh, I want to talk about India uh, okay. because we are here uh, and there's a lot of attention and focus on how compelling the India story is at this point in time. From Marriott's perspective, uh, you know, you had set a target of 200 hotels by 2025. I believe you're hoping to up that number. Yeah, we hope our expectation is that between open and pipeline hotels, we'll have at least 250 hotels across the country by 2025. We're in 40 cities today. That should be 50 cities or more by 2025. And maybe most exciting to me, that results in us creating 10,000 new jobs across India. You know, you talked about the pipeline in India. Uh, which end of the market do you believe uh, you are? feel that you're going to see much more sort of demand coming in? What, you, what is going to be the priority in terms of what you intend to focus on here in India? Well, I, I think in any market in the world, our development strategy is relatively simple. Our objective is to make sure we have the right product in every market our travelers want to visit for any type of, of trip purpose. I think here we've got to continue to stay focused on the domestic market, which is strong and growing. And I mentioned to you earlier, we had the, the good fortune to spend a bit of time with your tourism minister. And one of the things we talked about is the importance as an industry, and certainly from Marriott's perspective, to continue to tell the story globally about what a rich and diverse set of experiences the country offers. And we want to make sure we have lodging offerings in all of those, those destinations. You know, you talked about your meeting with the tourism minister and uh, we were just chatting uh, uh, out of the back before we came onto stage and you said that uh, India needs to lose a little bit of its humility and tell uh, its story in terms of its diversity of culture, tradition and experiences. And just like Marriott, you need to get rid of uh, some of your humility and tell your story better. How do you, how do you intend doing that? Well, I think that really relates to our culture and the opportunities that we create for our associates around the world. Uh, as you point out, one of the things I treasure about our company is our humility. But as an industry and as a company, we have an amazing story to tell about the careers that are created. As I've been traveling this week with our leadership team in India, 
We've been sharing stories about how we started in the industry. And you hear story after story about starting in hourly frontline positions. And, and just through hard work and ambition, the ability to rise. And I think it's a unique attribute of the travel and tourism sector and a story we need to tell more forcefully and more vocally. Uh, you know, I, I just want to labor a little bit more on the India connection. I yep. believe 25% of your C-suite uh, is of Indian origin. That's exactly right. Uh, Raj Menon, who runs uh, the APEC region for us, uh, Satya Nan, who runs Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and Tina Edmondson, who runs our global luxury group. Uh, all born and raised in India. All born and raised in India. That's good to hear. So I want to understand from you, Tony, now, uh, you know, as we look at the trends that have emerged and shaped the travel and hospitality industry post-COVID, mm -hmm. uh, which ones do you believe are less likely to be more permanent? I mean, you know, what's happened in terms of technology and the use of technology? Where do you find the balance between too much contact, too little right. contact? And I know most hospitality majors are dealing with some of these balances at this point in time. But what do you believe will be the transient changes? What do you believe are likely to be the more permanent changes? Well, I, you know, technology is an interesting topic on two fronts. I do think one of the permanent changes we'll see is an acceleration in adoption of technologies that existed long before the pandemic. So when you look at take rates for mobile check-in, mobile key, chat functionality, those, those capabilities always existed, but by necessity or by uh, a sense of apprehension early in the recovery, more and more guests are adopting those technologies, discovering the ease with which they can enable their travel, and I think that'll continue for years to come. The more impactful change, I think, is this idea of blended trip purpose. And we talked about this a little bit in our fourth quarter earnings call. The fact that Sunday and Thursday were the days of the week that recovered most quickly, I think are the, the best empirical data that support this idea that more and more travelers are blending leisure and business travel or leisure and group travel. I think that's great news for our industry, and it's a trend I expect to see continue uh, into the future. How exciting is the market from an India perspective, especially as far as things like the villas and luxury homes business is concerned? Well, it is fascinating to me. Uh, for all of you and certainly for the Marriott team, 20 and 21 were the two most challenging years in the history of our business. Interestingly, they were the two strongest years in our history in the branded residential business. And so I, I'm very encouraged about the strength of our branded residential business, both co-located with hotels and on a standalone basis. Uh, just uh, Monday, we toured a spectacular project in Mumbai, and I think you'll see more and more traction for branded residential. Homes and Villas was a platform we launched, and often the question I get, did you launch that to compete with Airbnb? And the answer is no, and I'd go back to my earlier response about how we think about growing our business. I don't ever want to give one of our loyal customers, one of our loyal Bonvoy members, a reason to look outside our ecosystem. And one of the things they learned and we learned during the pandemic, for a very specific trip purpose, a multi-bedroom, full luxury home better fits their needs. Think about multi-generational travel as maybe the best example of that. The launch of homes and villas allowed us to keep that customer within the Bonvoy ecosystem. And I, th I don't think it's a coincidence that we saw our volume of listings grow by more than 20-fold over the two years of the pandemic. So is there headroom for more growth within this ecosystem? I mean, what, 31 brands and counting at this point in time, Tony? Uh, you know, what does the future look like in terms of addition? And is there any likelihood of uh, pruning the portfolio of, of axing things that don't work, especially after that massive 2016 Starwoods acquisition? Well, you ask that question much more elegantly and politely than the analysts do, where they usually say, how can you have so many brands? Are you going to divest yourself of certain brands? And my answer is consistent because I really believe it. I think the breadth of the portfolio provides a set of choices for both our guests and our owners and franchisees that is really compelling. Um, if I felt like there was a, a brand or a set of brands in the portfolio, that didn't fit in the architecture well, of course we'd consider divestiture. But nothing so far. No, and I don't see anything on the horizon. We're quite happy with the breadth of the portfolio. Um, in terms of future growth, one of the, the benefits of our industry-leading scale, I don't feel the need to do M&A transactions to gain additional scale, 
But if there is a geography mm -hmm. where we feel like we're not growing organically at the pace we would like, or a, a gap in our brand architecture, it's certainly something we'll consider. And if you look at our history, clearly the Starwood transaction tends to dominate those, those headlines. But I think we've had a, a very well-balanced uh, strategy of adding some brands through M&A and adding some brands organically, and that has served us well. Uh, you know, so what kind of appetite do you have for growth at this point in time inorganically and specifically in a market like India? Is that likely to be a strategy that you want to consider? Well, I, without question, there is a long runway of opportunity for luxury in India. I think we're in our infancy of growing our, our industry-leading luxury portfolio here. Um, that's probably an area where we'll continue to look to, to grow our footprint. You know, in this era where everybody is talking about how do you integrate chat GPT right. into your operations, what is it going to mean? And I want to link this back to a challenge that I know the hospitality and tourism industry is facing globally, and that is a manpower crisis at this point in time. How do the two converge? Yeah. So I get this question a lot, particularly in the, in the wake of chat GPT. And in fact, I, I spoke at MIT in, in Massachusetts a few weeks ago, and I had a student raise their hand and say, isn't this exciting? Couldn't you imagine a day where you have a hotel with no employees? And my response was, my goodness, I hope not, right? We are in the hospitality industry. And, and so, of course, technology will continue to drive efficiency in the operation of our hotels. But my, my hope and my expectation is that what technology will also do is create capacity for our associates so that they have more capacity to really engage in a personal way with our guests. Yeah, I would imagine a hotel with no people right. uh, on the other side is going to be a bit problematic. At least I can't imagine one at this point in time. Uh, when, what are you changing in the prototype of some brands like Moxie? I think you just spoke about that. You spoke about the vacation homes expanding in India as well. Uh, so I think you've, we've, we've covered some of those questions. If you have fresh questions coming in for Tony, Although I would do, make do one send them comment yeah, there. Go ahead. It's, um, this debate goes on in the U.S. and I'm sure in other countries around the world every day. But for U.S. companies, I think we're all faced with a fundamental question. Are we a global company or are we a U.S. company that happens to have some operations outside our borders? Certainly our aspiration is to be a true global company. And when you think about growing brands in different markets around the world, your willingness to invest the time and energy to understand the wants and needs of the domestic traveler and customize your brand, certainly maintaining a thread of continuity on a global basis. But we were talking in a meeting this morning about when we brought Fairfield to India. Uh, we spent months and months doing focus groups with Indian travelers. It influenced the name we used. It influenced the design. It influenced the service offering. And certainly a, a U.S. or a European traveler would recognize that it's a Fairfield. But that's a product that is tailored to the local Indian traveler. And I think if you aspire to be a real global company, you've got to have the willingness to adapt and not just pull your domestic prototype off the shelf and roll it out globally. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's an important point that you make in terms of uh, uh, staying global, yeah. but also staying relevant yes. to, to local needs and experiences. Tony, what I want to understand from you, uh, from a industry perspective and specifically from a Marriott perspective, sustainability and the efforts on that front because this is, a, this is an industry that's part of the problem yep. and needs to do much more as far as the solution is concerned. So specific priority areas on the sustainability agenda that you intend to focus on. Of course. And, and, and I, certainly I can talk about Marriott, but it is a challenge for everyone in this room. Um, from a personal perspective, I'm very much of the view that I'm fortunate to be a a temporary tenant on this beautiful planet. I, th I feel a personal responsibility to protect the planet. Um, but even if you don't have that view, it is a business imperative. When I think about the four constituents that we serve, our guests, our associates, our owners, and our investors, all of them are demanding not just flowery language, but substantive goals and demonstrated progress against those goals. So of course we've made a commitment um, to get to net zero by no later than 2050. We've made commitments on water and, and energy and the like. Um, the one thing I worry about a little bit, there's so much focus on climate, which there should be, but there are other areas under the umbrella of ESG. Uh, food waste is maybe the best example of that. 
40% of the food that is produced in the world ends up in the trash. And you've got food insecurity around the globe. And so I think there are a, a variety of areas where the company is focused to setting meaningful goals and then publishing annually our Serve 360 report, which demonstrates our progress against each of those goals. And progress on gender parity, because I know that that is something that you're focused on as well. It is. We, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. On one hand, I look and I say, our C-suite is at gender parity. Uh, what we call our senior leadership, vice president and above globally, by the end of this year will be at gender parity. More than half our board is at gender parity. So we have a wonderful story to tell. And each and every time I share those statistics, my answer is, and that's not nearly enough. Because whether it's on sustainability, whether it's on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I am of a firm view that the minute you are self-satisfied in those areas, you go into a bit of a death spiral. It requires consistent and deliberate focus to achieve the sort of goals that our industry demands. You know, speaking of consistent and deliberate goals, I want to ask you this in the context of the competitive landscape. And there's a question that's come in. Uh, what is your favorite hotel brand outside of the Marriott portfolio? And uh, what, Chris Nasasha is here as well. So, uh, you know, maybe you want to send out a shout out. Well, you know, my dear friend Chris is here. I won't say a Hilton brand, but, but they obviously have a, a particularly fantastic set of brands. Um, if I had to pick one, I might say Hyatt Regency for a very personal reason. My very first job in the industry, I was a night auditor at the Hyatt Regency in Baltimore, night Maryland. Auditor. Yes. So I, I would probably say that. And what about an Indian brand? An Indian brand? Well, it's hard not to say Taj. I mean, Taj is an iconic brand on a global basis, and I, I think they have, have generated some of the world's most extraordinary hotel leaders uh, that have taken that expertise around the world. Well, uh, I'm sure Puneet Chatwal is here. Uh, there he is. Uh, that, that should bring a smile to his face. But, you know, in terms of trends that we are seeing at this point in time, and uh, I know you have a daughter who's, uh, who is headed into the hospitality business as well, currently studying. Uh, but with this generation, the way that they're spending, what they're spending on, the experiential aspect of travel and hospitality, what are the trends that you believe that the industry and you particularly intend to focus on to capture this market? So this is another trend that started prior to the pandemic. The notion that more and more consumers are shifting their spending from consumption of hard goods towards experiences. And I think the, the pandemic acted as a bit of an accelerant. That was a trend that you saw in the younger generations. I think across age groups now, there is this, this deep appetite to invest in experiences. And so as we think about programming our hotels and growing our system, authentic and local are the, word, the buzzwords that we use often. Uh, if someone travels to India, they want to be with a team that is Indian, that can share their rich heritage. They want to dine on Indian food prepared by Indian chefs. They want to be shown experiences that they don't see in a tour book that are authentic and local. 99% um, of our associates across our 140 hotels here in India are Indian associates, and we'll continue to grow leadership in that way as well, so we can deliver those authentic experiences. Authenticity is, of course, going to be a big focus area as far as you're concerned. Uh, but, you know, some of the challenges, and we just talked about mm -hmm. the high interest rate environment, I mean, the cost of money has gone up significantly. Do you believe that that's going to impact supply uh, in the next few years, not just for Marriott, but for the industry as a whole? Yeah, I, I mean, right now what we see, the availability of debt for new construction on, a, on many markets around the world is probably the single biggest impediment to growth. I think whether it's us or Hilton, the big brands will get a disproportionate share of the debt that's available. But what you'll see as a result is an uptick in conversions. We talked on the fourth quarter earnings call about roughly a third of our signings and openings being in the conversion category. And the, the pandemic rattled the industry to its core. We saw our business drop more than 90%. And I think increasingly owners say the, the comfort of being able to plug into powerful global revenue engines to get the benefit of the reach of the industry's largest loyalty program, um, that should continue to drive conversion volume even in the face of a, a tough debt environment. What about pricing power? Do you believe that you will be able to continue to hold? We think so. I mean, in the fourth quarter alone, 
We saw uh, global RevPAR up 5%, driven by 13% growth in ADR globally. So we continue to see strong pricing power. As I look into 2013, I think our RevPAR growth will be a bit more balanced with contribution from both occupancy and rate growth, but we continue to see strong pricing. Strong pricing uh, continues for 2023. Uh, what would you put down as the single biggest risk that you're monitoring at this point in time outside of the, the macroeconomic uncertainties and challenges that we just spoke of? I don't know that I would call it a risk, but maybe one of the most important focus areas for me is the health of our owners and franchisees. Um, as I talk with my teams around the world, I say we should most certainly take a moment or two and celebrate RevPAR returning to pre-pandemic levels, but then we should quickly pivot and remind ourselves that many of our owners and franchisees are in a very different place on the recovery curve. I wish I could tell you that the expense side of the ledger froze during the two years of the pandemic, but it certainly didn't. And so the, the financial pressure that the owner community continues to face has to be top of mind for us. You know, since you're talking about that, this is a linked question that's come in uh, from somebody. During the conference yesterday, it was discussed that hotel management contracts are one-sided for operators. What are your comments on this? Uh, I humbly disagree. <laughs> and that's, thought, that that answer will might. surprise no one. <laughs> I, you know, I, it is interesting. I sometimes get questions about the state of our owner and franchisee relationships having gone through the pandemic. And speaking from Marriott's perspective, I would submit to you, I think those relationships are stronger than they've ever been. Why? Because of the transparency, because of the collaboration and the communication that we had with our partners. It was as if we set aside some of the petty disagreements we have in the course of day-to-day -day business, came to the same side of the table to try to slay the common foe of the pandemic. And I think as a result of that collaboration, our relationships are as strong as they've ever been. Uh, and I would imagine that, you're, that more work is going to be done to of ensure course. that this continues to be a of much course. more robust partnership and much more robust uh, collaboration. Uh, you know, given all the levers that we just spoke of, in terms of the outlook for margins, in terms of the return on capital employed, mm -hmm. uh, what does the next you know, two or three years look like? Well, without question, some of the, the margin pressure that we see as a result in certain markets of heat, light, and power costs increasing, labor cost increases, combine that with some floating rate debt where you're seeing real pressure on, on yields. In the short term, that pressure will exist. But again, speaking for Marriott, so many of our owners are long-term investors. Um, they have made a decision to invest in an industry that by its very nature is cyclical. And so they have a much longer term investment horizon as opposed to trying to time the investment for the next quarter or two. Now, the responsibility we have is to help them navigate the areas of that cycle that create the most pressure on their business model. But I think all of us, and particularly if you had any questions about the resiliency of travel, those questions have been answered over the last 24 months. And so most of our partners tend to have that medium to long-term horizon that gives them quite a bit of optimism. You know, you talked about uh, the resilience of the hospitality industry, and I think that there were many obituaries written about many industries at the start of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Travel, hospitality, aviation were just few of them. What has the pandemic taught you personally uh, as an individual, but more importantly as a CEO? Well, at, in terms of the industry, Travel and the desire to explore the world has been embedded in humans' DNA since the dawn of time. Um, so I, I don't think that will change. I think the last 24 months is the best illustration of that. I shared with you a quote that I love from uh, the Roman philosopher Seneca who said, travel and change of place imparts vigor to the mind. And one of the things I love about that quote uh, you mentioned I have a college-age daughter. I'm convinced she thinks travel became popular when Instagram launched. But the reality is travel has been part of what human beings crave uh, forever. And, and that gives me enormous optimism. Um, in terms of taking on my no, new role in the face of this challenge, it's really about transparent communication and the value of deliberate listening. Uh, whatever we've done to improve our relationship with our stakeholders, it's a result of not talking so much. It's of sitting and, and 
clearing our mind and being deliberate about listening to what we can do to help them grow their businesses. Well, Tony, that's the perfect end to our conversation. Right. Thank you so much for listening, but of thank course. you so much for answering uh, my questions as well and sharing your insights on what uh, uh, we are seeing in terms of demand, what we're seeing in terms of emerging trends, but more importantly, where the Marriott Group is headed right. over the next few years. Always a pleasure. Thank you very, very thank much. You. Thank you. Appreciate it.